I think that's like the bank qualifications of old, right? I mean, that was that's right. That's right. 100%. Cold call gets you on the phone. Okay, do you have a budget? <laughs> I mean, do you have a need. It's, that's a perfect example, right? Because yeah. like, if a stranger called me, I didn't know they were going to call me. Asked about a budget to buy something I wasn't planning for. Yeah. No, why would I have budget for that? <laughs> you know, like, mm-hmm. like, why would I even tell the stranger? There's no way. There's no way. Yeah. Conversations are at the heart of everything we do. But how do you turn a conversation into revenue? Welcome to B2B EQ, a podcast from Unifor. I'm your host, Tim Harris. Join me as I interview business leaders and market makers to learn how to move deals forward, scale best practices, and establish relationships that create value and grow revenue. Let's get started. Welcome back to another episode. Today's guest is an absolute wealth of sales knowledge, someone who understands that selling is serving at the highest level. He is dedicated to helping sellers excel in their organization, a three-time Salesforce top sales influencer, member of the Forbes Business Council, author of Six Figure Sales Secrets. This man knows what he's talking about. President and founder of Venley Consulting Group, Marcus Chan. Marcus, great to have you on. Hey, it's my absolute pleasure. I'm excited to be here. I'm simply a guy who's made a lot of mistakes, and hopefully I can share some of my mistakes and learnings along the way today. A, a humble man and and someone that I, I've enjoyed following your content, seeing your journey. I feel like I always get free lessons on LinkedIn that I get to share with my sales team, or even from a marketing pr- approach, kind of really redefine how I think about things. And especially like outbound and some of the things we'll talk about later, but on your website, you had a statement, selling isn't rocket science. And I, I want you to break that down because it, it caught my attention. I always, you know, looking at sites, reading through the copy, but I just love that approach because I think there's so much just simple human parts of what makes mm. selling work. Um, yeah. Tell me why it's not rocket science. What are the simple you know, I, foundations? I think uh, all of us, um, even even some like pretty well-known sales trainers and coaches out there, I think a, a lot of people kind of overcomplicate sales um, and we paint it as something just really wildly crazy, something really, really complex. And I think that creates actually a lot of confusion and it gets people to essentially less effective in the actual process. Because when you think about sales, generally speaking, it's relatively simple, right? Meaning you find great qualified prospects, you help mm-hmm. them cover their situation in a future desired situation, you solve a problem, and that's really it. At the very core of it, you're just solving problems. And I think when you start to understand and understand the whole reason why sales even exists to begin with, you can start to apply it to your own sales process. And obviously, there's many ways to, to go about it, but mm-hmm. you're not building a rocket ship. You're not sending people to the moon. You're simply solving problems for a business owner, a founder, or an exec. And, and usually in fairly specific use cases, right? I mean, all of us 100%. have a product. We kind of have our mm-hmm. swim lanes that we can help with. Mm-hmm. So, so you're like a doctor where you where you can go in. It's not like I need to solve the whole body. I just need to fix that arm pain or that knee pain or whatever it might be. That's it. That's 100% it. It's like if I can go in, if I can uncover what's causing these symptoms, uncover the root cause mm-hmm. and see if it's something I can help, then I'm going to help them. You don't have to do weird closing tactics or strategies or weird sleazy things. You're simply solving a problem. And it goes back to where you said it's it's the highest level of serving, right? And, and 100%. I think that's where maybe we miss this, right? There's the pressures mm-hmm. of quota attainment and productivity. And I feel like we go back countless times. I've been in the selling tech to sellers for the last mm-hmm. 10 years. And we overcomplicate this, like you said, but is it is it a technology overcomplication? Is it a sales process? Like, why why do we make selling so hard? Well, I think um, I think it's a combination of all of the above, right? Mm-hmm. So, let's just say, even from a technology perspective, um, if there are too many tech tools to use, sometimes even reps will get confused. Like, which one should I use? Which is the best one, right? Mm-hmm. If there's too much knowledge out there, who should I listen to? What should I follow? So there becomes, we're actually in a world where I find there's probably a, 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 an inundation of too much information, you have information mm-hmm. overload. So if you're, let's say if you're new, how can you block the noise out and really identify what's going to be useful for you? So I think there's, there's, there's more resources than ever to be more successful, but mm-hmm. I think most will get actually overwhelmed and they get, they get lost and they're not able to execute the fundamentals 
of how to really excel in the sales process. And I think a lot of salespeople, generally speaking, choose to try to find these like shortcuts to have success in sales. They're more like tactical things. Like, oh, if I say it's one liner, they'll open an email. If I say it's yep. one line on, on a call, they're going to close. Versus actually understanding the fundamentals of human influence behavior, then they'll, they'll actually start to internalize something greater. And they realize the tactics are a result of certain strategies. And the tactics may change, but the strategies don't really change over time. Now, what are some of those fundamentals from your point of view, like your lens? What do you look for? Mm. So a really simple one, which is, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been probably overstated, but you know, the best salespeople aren't the best at closing or pitching and the best demo or whatever. Most of them are just really good at asking really good questions and diving really deep. So that's the skill to be able to not just have like a list of questions a lot of salespeople have, but to be able to read the prospect, go deeper and uncover the deeper levels of pain within the conversation. And that's that's a, that's that's a strategy that, can, that has not really changed over time. The best reps still do that. But mm -hmm. the tactic that people are trying to use these days is like, okay, let me um, create a list of questions and try to checklist them down. Or let me have technology as an AI coach on my sales call and it's prompting me to ask questions. So instead of me being present and internalizing what's going on in the conversation, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm so quick to go to my next question that the AI prompt is telling me to ask. Yeah. So yeah. it becomes one of those things where it can also hurt you if you're not if you don't understand sales as a process and you're just trying to check a box to get something done. I think that's like the bank qualifications of old, right? I mean, that was That's right. That's right. <laughs> Cold call gets you on the phone. Okay, do you have a budget? <laughs> I mean do you have a need. It's that's a perfect example, right? Because yeah. like if a stranger called me, I didn't know they were gonna call me, asked if I had a budget to buy something I wasn't planning for. Yeah. No, why would I have budget for that? <laughs> You know, like, mm -hmm. like why well, don't I even tell the stranger? There's no way. There's no way. Yeah. It makes sense. And so that leads me to the next thing. Like, how is outbound changing? Because at one time, crazy enough, like cold calls and all that stuff, and still many to this day will, you know, raise the flag. It does work in a volume game. But the numbers I see on conversion rate and open rate and answer rate are dismal. So how do people outbound in today's environment. And I even think of AI and like chat GPT and God, the amount of emails I'm going to get that are probably pretty good, mm -hmm. but still so, don't get a response. Yeah. I think what's, what's interesting is, um, you know, whenever someone's like, hey, uh, cold calling is dead, cold emailing is dead, cold LinkedIn, you know, cold email, cold DMs are dead, whatever. Um, I think it's only dead if you do it terribly. I believe, generally speaking, most sales organizations have gotten very lazy with tech. Okay. Because now you can like buy the data, throw it into a sequence and just send out thousands of emails a day. That's what they're doing. And when it's mm -hmm. easy like that with AI, chat GPT, and all these things, there's so much more noise as you, as you know. Mm -hmm. And the only real way to break through, right, which hasn't really changed that much, if you think about it from a strategy perspective, which is number one, ensure it's actually hyper relevant when you're actually yep. reaching out. Make sure it's actually like it's aligned to the right person. Also, like, Make sure you're hitting on multiple channels. Like that hasn't really changed that much, but I think a lot of people have gotten lazy. Yeah. So even if they, if, if they create in whatever sequence tool they use and they have all these different things they could do, right? From calls, emails, texts, you know, direct messages, et cetera, hit them on social, whatever. They just kind of allow the automation to run as emails and everything else. And they kind of just haphazardly do the calls, haphazardly do everything else and just kind of do a poor job. Mm -hmm. and, and the reality is, is like, if, they, if you do a, a half-assed job on the cold call and they actually answer, you're going to not book the call. Yeah. Right? So like I'll take a look and I look at the data points of, you know, of, you know, some of our clients and, you know, even the, the connect rate has gone down, which for sure, that's going to happen for sure. You know, open rates may go down, the soul can go down, but the conversion rate on the call is still really low, mm -hmm. which again tells me like, let's just say for example, even they have a 5% connector rate. And they, let's say they have like, I don't know, 20 conversations in a month, so make a number up. If they're only booking a couple of those, and if they did a good job with targeting, that means they booked two out of, say, 20, that's 18 they didn't book. Mm -hmm. Now, why didn't they book? Was the skill of the rep? Had only objections? What was exactly? Mm -hmm. Even if it's, even with the state of the, the outbound the way it is today, 
the key is, is just like anything else is how can we become more effective at it, right? So whatever tool we're going to use, and I think eventually over time, maybe there'll be new mediums, right? Yeah. But with the current mediums that are, are currently available, even if you're impacted some of these things, you can't control people who are going to be mass messaging. But what can you control? What can, can, uh, what can you control? The quality of the relevance of the email, right? Mm-hmm. The quality of how you have that phone conversation, right? And wherever people are the noisiest, how can you stand out amongst the noise? How can you do something that's a little bit different than everybody else, right? How could you, if you know it's a target account, how could you incorporate physical mailers? How can you switch it up so it's different than everyone else that's just using AI to create emails to mass blast? Mm-hmm. So when you start thinking this way, you're thinking from a strategy, all you think, all you think about from a strategy perspective is how can I break through the noise? Again, that hasn't changed in years. Yep. The medium might have changed, but when you start thinking this way, this is how you, how you start to stand out. But what I, what I see, I think the state of outbound, what we're going to see is, I think we'll see probably smaller sales teams. So you'll maybe mm-hmm. a SDR team, except because they can use AI for these type of things. Or yep. we'll get to the point where they might, they might even not have SDRs anymore and go back to full cycle like it used to be. Yeah, right. I, was, I was a full cycle rep. Go back to full cycle reps, right? Smaller teams, full cycle reps, better trained, more precision, better results. That's that's an interesting way to go because when you think of it, it's it's reabsorbing almost that function back into marketing as well, right? Because what you just Correct. shared with me is like what I see as really a marketing function, like get your Correct. attention. Yes, but we've put right. a salesperson in that role almost as a one to one, right? And you, yeah, maybe it'll shift on back. And then I like that idea because what we're seeing in, in some of our research is that buyers, when they go out and they say, okay, this was a great sales call or this was a horrible sales call from their side, their perspective, mm-hmm. they want to be heard and understood. They want to be right. met with business knowledge and business acumen, mm-hmm. not product acumen. Right. And and like you're saying, that that more specialized sales rep is probably the the person of tomorrow, like that that true oh, sales right. rep that's going to win tomorrow. They, they, you know, buyers today are more skeptical than ever, as you and I mm-hmm. both know, right? Yeah. Um, so if you have a rookie outbounding them, yeah. and they sound like a rookie and they don't have the level of executive acumen or conversational acumen that you should have when you call it that level, they're going to get pushed down. Yeah. You know, they're going to get pushed down. So um, the the future of sales I see, whether it's outbound full cycle, is like sp- that spe- level of specialization but they truly are acting as the trusted advisor if they want to survive. If mm-hmm. they're not able to, they're kind of like, well, I'm just going to not think for myself and kind of just fall into this bucket of everything else. Well, it's going to hurt you. You know, where reality is, is having technology like AI and tools like that, it should be tools in your tool belt. It should be the rocket fuel to the engine like you discussed before. It's mm-hmm. going to enhance what you're doing, but you, the basis of who you are must be pretty good to begin with. Yeah. Oh, abs- yeah, absolutely. Because I think it's a it's a lift of the bottom third or the bottom two thirds. Mm-hmm. But I see that across all industries right now with the AI reports. It's like, if you're a really good copywriter, a really good journalist, or a really good this, you're typically not using as much AI from the just mm-hmm. generative AI chat GPT function, right? Mm-hmm. As that person who's a new hired person that's trying to really up their career or win in, right. in kind of upskill. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's fascinating. So what are you seeing with your clients in terms of like their AI strategy in sales? What are some of the things that are like early adoption and yeah. where do they want to go in the next few years? Uh, so I think a lot are not doing much, to be quite yeah. frank. <laughs> in terms of um, generative AI, right? Some yeah. of them may already have some tools, they already have other AI from you know, indexing, et cetera, on the back end. Um, uh-huh. But in terms of like generative AI, I mean, some of them, you know, they're adopting some tools that have some AI already built in. Right. Um, but a lot of them have, you know, tech bloat, right? Which is like yeah. they just have a lot of extra tech. They, they don't have the, the adoption that they're hoping to have, anyways. Um, so they themselves aren't really sure. I mean, at least in my opinion, this, this current iteration of AI is not quite out of the box ready yet. Right. Yeah. Like I think about whenever you want mass adoption of something, it ha- it just like when you develop a new habit, it's got to be simple, easy to use, and appealing to use. So that's why I think about like an iPhone is a perfect example. Like mm-hmm. you give us a baby, they know how to use it, right? And I think eventually when AI gets to that point, I think we'll see a, a, a more mass adoption. But as of right now, a lot of them are almost in this, let me sit back and wait. Yeah. Um, you know, because there's also the fear, you know, there are, is fear around data security for sure. Yeah. Like, 
okay, if we get this and we upload our data inside, how secure is it? We're uploading, you know, financials, et cetera, or all our customer data and we're trying to generate reports, et cetera. How secure is it? Um, yeah. There's also, as you know, a lot of, a lot of fly by night AI companies. So, yeah. you know, if they're a pretty well established organization, do they really want to trust adding this new tech stack, you know, tech stack, uh, tool to the tech stack that may not yeah. be around after a year? So I think many of them are kind of this early stage is not really doing much, kind of observing it, unless they, um, unless they're already using like a you know a, a pretty well known tool they've used for a long time that has AI built in. So for example, let's just say like if they're using Salesforce, you know, yeah. Salesforce can go anywhere, right? Yep. So the new AI tool comes out, they're going to be more open to using Einstein and utilizing it because they already trust the brand, they already trust the system, um, versus the fly by night company, they're not going to really do too much. Um, I, I think, yeah, you're spot on. A lot of people sitting on the sideline and then I look at where it can go and I guess my whole side of it is right now, I feel like we're just in that productivity game, right? It's it's making a lot of noise. It's making a lot of generic email, generic content. I'm curious to see like some of the things you read with Gartner where it's like, hey, by 2027, like this will be influencing playbooks or this will be your, your sales co-pilot, like you've said. Yep. But I think- the piece we're missing, I know one of the things that's been fun to work on on the emotion AI front is like getting that human connection piece and making yep. sure that the AI has the ability to also get the subtle cues, the subtleties, the human mm-hmm. cues of what's going on in a conversation. Totally, totally. And, and, and I always think about too, it's like, as, as we know, whatever data points get fed into the AI, it's what well, it gets trained on. Mm-hmm. So can we trust the data being fed into the AI so we can interpret properly? Right, yeah. or even from like even from the emotional intelligence perspective, I'm sure that about the stupid. It's like different cultures act different ways. <laughs> Very <laughs> you know? much so. Yeah. Right. Can the is the agony smart enough to be able to read that? Hey, because they're of this culture, they're more stoic. Yeah. Just because they're more stoic doesn't mean they're not interested. Very you true. Know, they have other sentiment pieces that show that they are actually engaged, but their facial expression may not show it exactly. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. Well, it's and it goes back to that human skill, that ability to read the room or that ability to connect and build trust. That's right. So with sellers kind of on that thread, trying to differentiate in a market. Okay, we've we we know it's noisy. We know there's it's harder than ever to get an at bat. So I've got to have a win rate. I've got to have a hit rate. I Mm -hmm. kind of liken it to the baseball analogy, right? That's Mm -hmm. your that's your key metric. Yeah. How do you show up differently? What are some tactics or some some strategies even that somebody can apply listening in at this podcast goes, man, I got a Zoom call in 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. How can I show up differently? How can I make this memorable? Great. So um, I, I'm a firm believer sales is can be like a death of a thousand paper cuts. Mm-hmm. It's like just thousands of micro decisions that you make that can either help you or hurt you. So if you start thinking this way, if you start thinking – what can I control from every possible decision that I make that's going to hopefully increase my win, win rate with a prospect, right? Mm-hmm. So I'll point out a few things. And they're, and they're, by the way, there are nothing crazy or earth-shattering, but simply by doing it, you're already going to be ahead of a majority of people. And I, I equate it's much like when you look at, say, the, the Olympians who run track. Mm-hmm. Like someone runs a 100-meter 100, 100 dash right, or 110-meter hurdles, the first place winner versus the second place winner it's like microseconds, right? It's hundreds of a second, maybe thousands of a second. But that mm-hmm. first place winner wins like 10x amount of money, sponsorship, et cetera, versus second place winner. They're not 10 or 100 times better than the second place winner. They're only that much better. They're only like mm-hmm. 100 of a second better, right? And in sales, it's the same thing. It's these little hundreds of seconds, little things you can do that'll make you stand out. So like, for example, like, let's talk about even like uh, preparation for a call. Yeah. Like before you, you get your discovery call, did you properly research the company you're about to meet with, the prospect you're about to talk, have a conversation with, personal professional? Did you look at this press releases or website? What's in the news? What's on social media? What are maybe their priorities? If they're pro- they're publicly traded, you know, what are their earnings transcripts saying? What do they have in the last call? What are analysts saying? Mm-hmm. Plus, if you just take a few minutes to do some proper research and take a few notes down and come to the point of view, and you're already ahead of the game by just simply doing that. All right. So that's one really simple example. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. To also, like, you know, this sounds crazy, but like, you get on, I say it's a Zoom call, you know, it's a, it's a virtual, you get on a virtual call with them. 
Mm-hmm. How are you showing up? Like when, when you look into the camera, how do you dress? How do you show up? How do you carry yourself? Mm-hmm. Do you look like you're a schlob or, you know, just like you just got out of bed? Or do you look like a professional that they can trust? You know, I, I'm not saying everyone needs to wear a full suit, but like, are you dressing for the image you want that person to see that's going to help you increase your win rate? To how do you run the call? How mm-hmm. do you ask questions? How do you dive deep? What's your level of acumen? So for example, let's just say if you sell to a lot of CTOs, mm-hmm. do you study the CTO in their industry? Do you subscribe to different periodicals, newsletters? Do you read on them? Do you have Google Alerts tied to their industry? So you are becoming more well-rounded as a professional. Mm -hmm. And people can tell if you Google something really quick versus you actually know it intently, right? Absolutely. Again, these are these little things that you just start doing over time. It starts to build up, right? Then even on the call, when you're when you're when you're going in deep and you're diving and you're asking questions, what type of questions are you asking? Are they insightful? Are they thoughtful? Do they make them think? And because of the way you 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 dive in deep and you challenge them potentially, are they walking away and saying, Wow, that's actually really interesting. I never actually I'm glad you asked. I never thought about this way. Huh. Mm-hmm. Because we're not doing X, it's actually impacting this, which is costing us X amount a year. Huh. It's very insightful. Now you're teaching them something new and something different. And you start thinking of the whole, the whole rest of the sales process, right? There's all these micro moments that you're doing that help you just stand out. They are they seem in the moment very inconsequential, if you will. Mm-hmm. You start adding them up. It starts positioning you as a trusted advisor, as a professional, I'll stand out. So even if you sell something that is easily commoditizing and has a lot of competition, but you're able to run your sales process in a way or position as a trusted authority, it's amazing how much more you'll close because you're actually controlling those little details. And how are you seeing companies today implement some of those habits? Because to me, that's like, that's personal development, professional Mm -hmm. development. But when that goes to scale, that's not just hiring. I've got a sales team today. I've got 60 people on the floor, for for example, say. Mm -hmm. How do you get that instilled? What's that leadership capability or, or program that you run to help that enablement? Good. Yeah. So, um, well, there's a few things. There's things obviously that I help with some of those companies, but then there's also stuff that like it's really important the company does well or has mm-hmm. things in place. So, like you kind of hit the nail on the head on the first thing you mentioned, which is number one, it starts with how do you hire? Yeah. Right. Like, are you hiring people that have a, the, the right level of values that actually care about this type of stuff? You know, and is your interview process designed a way to filter that out with well-structured questions or whatever you want to do to filter out and say, okay, these are, this is the most likely to fall within our company culture of who we are and how we want to show up, right? So I'll give you a really, really simple example. Mm-hmm. My very first, in my early in my career, I worked for a company called Enterprise Rent-A-Car, Enterprise Holdings. Many people have heard yep. of it, right? And like, it was just like suit and tie, right? That's how we had to wear it, or at least shirt and tie. So like mm-hmm. we're trained like from like 21, 20 years old. We got to wear a shirt and tie, look a certain way, have these clean shaven look. And like it's it's kind of old school, but you're kind of trained to like to be like yeah. cleaned up that way. All right. And because of that, a lot of companies would love to hire from them. They're like these people from enterprise, they work really hard. They're really gritty. They probably grew up poor, had nothing from the background. Yeah. But they can carry themselves pretty well. And they look a certain part. And they have pretty good trained. So they, they kind of create this indoctrination effect. Right. Mm-hmm. So you kind of figure out what do you want to hire? Like, who do you want to hire? What, what should, how should they look? And I'm not saying like race, gender, et cetera. I'm talking about like characteristics overall that you're going to value. So you start having that. Now, mm-hmm. on top of that, it's important then that you have some sort of onboarding process, right? To indoctrinate and train them, not just on, you know, the product dog, but company culture, the ICP, et cetera. So that's, that's really starting from the get-go of having this like good onboarding program to even bring them in, mm-hmm. all right? Now, the onboarding obviously has to be backed by the right people, where the proper leaders, proper like you know, uh, you know, probably you know, sales enablement, whatever they have, they have to have those in place, right? Mm-hmm. Now, in addition to that, it's really key. Now, in the perfect world, there's a good leadership development program because if they're hiring from the sales reps to, into the sales leadership, et cetera, 
Most of them will never have run a sales team before or they don't have much sales leadership, et cetera. So you have to create the environment for the leader to be able to develop and thrive. That might be training, et cetera, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Or someone's got to put into place because I'll, I'll give you a really simple example. Because if you, if you depend just on enablement, enablement by itself can only get them so far, right? Yep. The person dealing with the salespeople day to day, every single week with their ups and downs is going to be the sales leader. Does a sales leader have certain protocols in place that the company insists upon as part of their SOPs and how they run a business? So, for example, that could be, uh, you know, a weekly sales huddle as a sales team, weekly sales training, things to ongoing develop and train your people that can help you catch these type of things. Are there specific things that's expected of the sales leaders to fall through on as well? You know, you know, watch X number of call recordings a week, do certain things with the reps, ensure that, you know, there are, you know, attend certain number of calls to the reps. So mm -hmm. again, these are things in place to help kind of ensure the wheels on bus keep moving, right? And mm -hmm. then how are you- Getting that operational rhythm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then how do you add consistent ongoing training and development, right? And that's where companies will bring my team in to, for, for stuff like that because now we can kind of maintain and develop these other things as well um, and help it grow much deeper to a new level because again, you know, it's your number one asset. So you want to make sure you- develop them so they stay longer and generate more revenue for your business. Where do you see some of the biggest gaps in enablement? Uh, I'm curious, just kind of where do they show up? I'm sure it's all across the the spectrum, yeah. but where are some of the big potholes that you see? So um, I think uh, there's a few different ones. Um, I would say the number one, it's just like the the training tools and, and what, what they develop is just not relevant. Yeah. Right. So like it could be as simple as the people that developed them were never in sales, you know, that's 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 a, that's a pretty common one, unfortunately. Um, yeah. Uh, number two, uh, it's teaching with logic alone and not emotion. And let me Tell explain. Me more. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes like let's just say for example, whether it's it's an internal course and able put on is put on, maybe they're gonna hold a training class and teach them something, right? Mm -hmm. Like. like Number one, they probably teach too much about the product and not not, not but the ISP and the sales process. But that's a different point. But let's just say, uh -huh. for example, they're teaching like, "Hey, how to run discovery at our company." They'll say so. They'll be like, "Hey, cool! Like today, we're going to teach you about our five step discovery process. Step one, two, three, four. Here's what it is. All right. Here's some questions you want to ask. Yeah, uh -huh. logically makes sense, right? But how do you get them emotionally involved, right? How can you?" take the training and teach them through lessons and stories and then show them live, right? So mm -hmm. for example, like I used to run, I ran big sales teams for a long time, right? So I would go, this is how I would teach them. I would first teach them why it's important. I'd share a story. Okay. Let me give you an example of a situation. Boom. And so this way they're like, okay, they're, I'm warming them up. So there's some of this emotional part of the story. Stories sell, right? That's yeah. why. The number one influ tool for influence is a book, like the Bible, right? <laughs> so, anyways, yes. um, so you tell you tell through stories. So now, they're like, okay, interesting. So they're, they understand why it's important. They kind of understand what it is. Cool. Let's teach the framework now. Teach the framework, okay? They're still kind of understanding a little bit. Now, as a leader, I role play it with them. Okay, now you be the prospect, and I'm going to be you, and they get to watch it live. So now they're seeing like, okay, they're they're connecting the logic with emotion, what's really happening, okay? And then they do it. Mm -hmm. So from a learning perspective, not only connecting them emotionally and logically, you're also hitting all the you know all the styles of learning from auditory, visual, kinesthetic, et cetera. So now they're like internalizing it more, so a little more muscle memory from that. Mm -hmm. And that becomes hopefully – a better landing ground for getting them much more developed from a habits perspective. It's funny you say that because like I'm thinking of this and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, like that is to me the sales process too, yeah. right? Very much mm -hmm. so. I mean, it's all this. Get, them, get them hooked or brought them in with the story. The framework is kind of how you see the world differently or how you're solving their problems. 100%. And, and then it, 100%. yeah, so it's, it's, it's interesting that, you know, my, my takeaway on this is that we really don't sell enough internally. Yeah, uh, I think to it's, enable it's a, them to really sell really externally. Point. Yeah, right. So, um, so for for example, like, um, you know, I don't have an enablement team on my team, right? Because mm -hmm. I built all my own training. So I've whole have a, literally in, in, inside my company, I have built an internal training, which is basically an online course for every part of the sales process. 
And I'll teach them in a very similar format, right? So they can still watch it. And then when we're live together, we'll role play, et cetera. Um, mm-hmm. But I'll, I'll even, from the point of um, sound internal, I'll even intentionally use copywriting to label what sections are called to get them to pay attention, right? So for mm-hmm. example, in, instead of like, um, you know, your comp plan details explained, that's boring, <laughs> right? Like yep. how to maximize your comp plan to earn 500K plus. Hmm. Now I'm probably gonna pay attention when I watch that now. <laughs> right? like, absolutely. So it's like even just those, those little things are really intentional because um, just like a teacher sells to their students, we need to sell to our employees or staff to influence them to do a certain behavior. And if, if you're an enablement, your goal is not to create enabling tools and training. Your goal is to increase performance. Mm-hmm. So how can you increase your performance by winning the hearts and minds of those reps? And it starts with how you deliver it, how you structure certain things to take them on a journey from A to B. I love it. And then vice versa, that reflects in the way you sell prospects, which is the same 100%. thing winning over their hearts and minds. 100%. So how are you seeing once they're all revved up, once the enablement's coming together, what are the things that are winning over hearts and minds out in the sales process, out in, out in the wild, out when these sellers have to go, go close and win deals? What are some of the uh, things that, that really influence that decision? Or what are the, the leading indicators that you're telling your sellers to look for to know that, hey, this is a winnable deal. I've got this person interested. Oh, God. So in terms of yeah. like uh, maybe some of the buying signs, if you will, of the prospect. Yeah, is that right? absolutely. Cool. cool. Beautiful. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. So- um. And there's obviously many of them, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but you'll you'll see a lot of times there there number one is more so a, a shift in their energy, mm-hmm. right? So sometimes, especially, and this is more so if it's co- a cold prospect to like that you're converting from what I call late need to active need. Mm-hmm. They go from the resistance to like, oh, that's really interesting. Hey, how does it work like this? And their bi language shifts. Their tonality shifts, and they may be potentially asking more questions about what you do or the problem, or asking for your insight. Hey, what have you seen with other leaders, other CTOs in the SaaS space on the West Coast? What have you seen with other CHROs in the Midwest? Ooh, mm-hmm. now you, now you got you got them hooked in some way, shape, or form. So these are all really good buying signs, right? And then when they start asking more specific questions about your solution, offer, hey, like. What would you do in a situation like this? How would you solve this problem? What can you guys do X? Can you guys do Y? These mm-hmm. are going to be really good buying signs as well. Now, another really good buying sign too is if you if they start to invite other stakeholders proactively. That's a really good sign. You yep. know, like, hey, um, you know what? I love this. You know, we got to show we got to show this other person this other division. They have mm-hmm. a different organization, but I know we've been talking and she has the same problem. So now they're starting to invite other people as well. Uh, and that's really key. Um, and that's, that's why I think it's, it's, it's important to differentiate between a, um, a champion versus a coach, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Like, like a, a true champion is somebody who wants you to win and they're selling internally to move you upstream to make this deal happen. So they they actively so that, that's what they're doing. They're keeping mm-hmm. you in the loop. Hey, quick update on this. They're doing these things now, again. This is, this is a perfect prospect, by the way. <laughs> so <laughs> they may not need to do all these things, but some yep, of these yep. are already a really good sign, right? Um, those type of things are always really really powerful. And for they ask you if you can do X or if they can just ask, when they're when they're, just, when they're just engaged in the process, mm-hmm. really really key. Um, I find responsiveness is, is key as well. Uh, or when you ask them certain questions, they're more open to answering or more open to doing certain things. So, for example, if you're like, if you know they have a conversation with maybe the COO tomorrow, and you and you say, "Hey, cool, you should have a conversation with them." Let's just have a quick touch base tomorrow. Uh, you know, right after they say, "Sure, no problem," and then you say something like, "Cool, like what? What's like some of it's easy? I can text you as well. What's your cell number if you didn't already mm-hmm. have it?" And they're like, mm-hmm. "Here's my cell." When, when they're when there's level of engagement, it's like cool, and then when you text them, they're responsive. Yep, yep. 
So like all those kind of tell you if there's if the deal's kind of progressing nicely. Uh, it's not a guarantee every time, but those are kind of some of the nice things you'll start to see from a momentum perspective. I, th- I think it's interesting because we talk a lot about leading indicators mm-hmm. compared to the lagging indicators. And the lagging yep. indicators are like all the things you find in a CRM. Oh, they opened yeah. the email. Oh, they did those things. The activities, that stuff. And I feel like we've been so focused on those metrics and those data points, but very few companies are actually trying to capture the data points that you just talked about. Right. Right. Like, think about even like I call the call after the call. Yeah. Right. So like, let's just say you have a, I just had a conversation today with the, with the rep about this. Let's just say you have a, a great demo, seven people on there. Right. Mm-hmm. And the, the rep is like, we just got done this demo and it went, went really well, I think, but I don't really know what's happening next. And I'm like, what happened to the call for the call? He's like, the call for the call. I'm like, well, did you have a call set up with your champion right after? He's like, no. I'm like, did you call him right after? He's like, I didn't. Like that call for the call could be everything you need to know what happened that call for real. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. You know, like uh-huh. that five minute conversation that champion say, you did great here. This is what they're worried about. So can you provide me this so I can get them neutralized for you? Amazing. Right. This is where the real sound's happening, which is you're like the quarterback helping guide them, like conductor, like a maestro in an orchestra. You're just uh-huh. making the music happen, but you need all the players to make the, ma- the magic happen. Well, I, I think you're on to something. It's like if we can get to the point where, because we analyze all of our calls, I think most sales organizations now record, if not review most of their sales calls. But those are the nuggets that we've got to extract. I think that's mm-hmm. the key piece is. If I'm on an enablement team or if I'm a, a sales leader now, after listening to this episode, it's like, gosh, I need to go back and look for those signals, those buying signs. Mm-hmm. And how do I surface those things to my reps? Because mm-hmm. I don't think everybody sees them. That's what, that's mm-hmm. my big takeaway. Well, and I think it's like, and there's a balance of like, how do you make your, your let's call it, even your CRM, how do you make your deal cycle stages as simple as possible not having too many steps, right? You know, it's like, oh, like, yeah, like, could we, could we add a step? Like, did you have the call after the call? <laughs> you know, like, you try to like overdo it, to over engineer it, and then it becomes almost like too much, right? Yeah. Um, you know, and it's where there's a good balance of like understanding, like, okay, what are the core components, right? And what are some of the the non sequiturs of the deal, if you will, right? Some mm-hmm. of the, the the human subtleties that happen that actually move a deal forward. How can we capture I mean- those? I think that's I think that's what we're missing. My hope mm-hmm. and I, what I'm seeing happen in AI is that that's actually becoming possible. And 100%. I think that's where we're going to be in the next place where it's like down the road. That's what I hope. I hope we can really improve the EQ and the understanding and the reading of the room and sellers and teams are focused there, not on just the spam cannons and the volume up front. Well, and I think eventually over time- to take right, that like- whole circle, yeah. Like imagine like, let's imagine a world, who knows the time frame? It could be yeah. next year, it could be 30, 50 years out, maybe it never happens, right? That that true AI salesperson people are scared about, that's what they would do. Yeah. They have a call after the call to get separated. They do all those things. And I, I believe my in my personal opinion is that buyers, as long as they feel like the person talking to, whether it's real or not, whether it's AI or not, can yeah. truly help them. Mm-hmm. And like is like it's just doing the best thing for them. They're not going to care if it's a human or not. Yeah. Now, and, and, and I don't think you'll take the human out, right? I just no. don't think you will ever. You, they'll probably still be operated by the AI just to to step in with when need when need be. Yeah. But like that's why I think it's important now for all all salespeople for all leaders start internalizing and and just understand the capability, right? Mm-hmm. So you so you get the mental model thinking okay. As this tool evolves, how can I use it and leverage it first? Yeah. Because there will be some industries that will adopt it very quickly and, and others that won't for a long time. So how can, I be some of the, how can I be the early adopter for my own industry and make it really, really powerful? And, and going back to your point, that's that split second, right? That's mm-hmm. that thing that makes the whole difference. And I, and I love your analogy between professional athletes mm-hmm. and sellers because I think we've, we've had that go on for a long time and it's a, it's a good way to think of you know, it's not the it's not the mile; it's the inch that's going to kill you. That's right, exactly yeah. right. Awesome. Well, I got to go back to some of your history and before we wrap up. How did you get here? Tell us a little bit about your background, and and just yeah. kind of where you're working, some of the companies you're working with today, if you can. 
Totally. So, um, you know, so I got I got started in B two B sales in two thousand seven, um, and this mm-hmm. is actually I it's kind of my accident. I actually didn't think it was B two B sales. Um, mm-hmm. It was I was an intern for the same company for two years prior for the summers, and then in two thousand seven they started a new B two B division in Oregon, and I thought I I just didn't know it was considered B two B. Basically, they yeah. said, Marcus, you did a great job as an intern. We want you to basically build out this new startup division. Like we don't have any clients. And we want you to go to some clients. I'm like, that sounds really awesome. It was sales. I just didn't know it was called sales at the time. I just thought yeah. I was like, oh, this is really neat. This sounds like an op- I'm going to build something from scratch. I saw the vision. Or I sold the vision. Got into immediately really, I was in B2B sales. Didn't know anything about cold calling, cold emailing, doing door locks, walking in business. I didn't know any of that type of stuff. There was no marketing. There was no market automation. YouTube was barely open starting at that time. So there wasn't like really much sales resources. And I really struggled. Like two yeah. months in. I didn't close a single deal, almost got fired. My boss threatened to fire me. And that was really scary. Now, mm-hmm. d- during this whole time, the economy started tanking as well. Because this is like mi- this is like summer 2007 at this point. Yeah, so you're going to 2009. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it started to get a little hairy. Um, mm-hmm. And it started getting worse. Um, now, eventually, fortunately, fast forward, I figured it out. Started having success. Started like hitting number one every single month. Started getting promoted. I was actually like coming for several, several more years until 2011. Made another switch to a whole new company, new industry. Decided to mm-hmm. see if I could redo everything, right? Was the last company for, for uh, eight years, right? Went from starting as a sales, a completely new industry, to become a sales leader to a point where I was running an, an 85 person sales org, right? Nice. Um, and that, that, was, that was pretty fun. Did that for several years, uh, my last several years, until I grew the team to about 110. A lot of fun. Um, yeah. it, was, it was kind of a cool journey because during this whole time, um, life was just good. Like I was just like, you know, at this point, I got promoted like total, I think 12 times in nine years. Wow. Right? So I say 10 out of 10 because it sounds smoother, but it's really 12 times in nine years. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, and that was cool. And I was leading big teams, having a lot of fun. I was riding on the corporate jet around, like winning presidents club every year, making tons of money. Life was just good. Yep. And during this whole time, um, I never want to start my own business. That was never really a thing. Um, but in about 2016, I was this is when I first became a director running a pretty big organization. And mm-hmm. people kept saying Mark is like I was one of the youngest, you're one of the youngest directors in the company. It's a Fortune 500 company. And I was and they're like, How did you do this? I'm like, do what? They're like, how do you win every single year? How do you promote us so many times? How did you do it over and over and over in different industries? I'm like, I don't know, I work hard, I guess. And they're like, You should write a book. I'm like, I'll never write a book, you know, right? This is before I obviously I wrote a book. I'm like, that sounds kind of crazy. Mm-hmm. Now, during the same time, I started to learn about internet marketing and like ebooks. And this is before everyone in the month had an ebook. I'm like, yep. I should write an ebook at least then. I could write an ebook and see if I could just sell that. So, mm-hmm. did that, bought a course, created an ebook, sold it, made like $200 my first month. I'm like, wow, that's crazy. Strangers gave me money. That was amazing. Yeah. Still, didn't want to be an entrepreneur because I actually grew up really poor. My parents were entrepreneurs, they had a restaurant. And that was really tough hard. Yeah, yeah, tough business. 80 plus hours a week, not making a lot of money. I'm like, mm-hmm. entrepreneurship equals pain. You don't want to do that. <laughs> like, this is this is an opportunity. This is like online money. This is interesting. Yeah. So after the ebook thing, I started looking at other ways to make more money online. I'm like, this is really interesting. I'm like, what else could I build? I'm like, huh, maybe I can build an online course. Again, this is before everyone and their mother had an online course. Yes. So I'm like, bought, I bought a program, way more complex back then because the, the tech wasn't really quite there. Bought a program, how to do it. Took me about two years because I was still traveling a lot. So I was traveling. I was in a hotel room 100 nights plus, 100 plus nights a year. Um, mm-hmm. Just traveling around is crazy. But it took me two years and I'm like, I built an online course for B2B sales. This is like my very first version um, oh, nice. because I was like, people could ask me questions about B2B sales. I'm like, let me just create it and let me see what happens. Now, after two years, I finally launched it and I, I wasn't building an email list. I wasn't really posting on social media for like LinkedIn. I was posting on LinkedIn, Instagram. That's really it. And I launched it. And I woke up, made $2,000 overnight. Wow. And that was like, wow, this is like January 2019. I was mm-hmm. like, this is incredible. That's that's pretty uh, pretty amazing. Some strangers gave me some money, basically, right? <laughs> I'm like, okay, this is this is a little better, right? I was At this point in my career, I was also getting to a point where I was like, do I want to keep going this corporate career, right? Like, I was mm-hmm. making a lot of money. I invested pretty much everything. I was pretty smart with my finances. I'm like, I could keep doing this? Or I'm gonna do my own thing. What, what do I want to do? Mm-hmm. And you know, at this point, I'm like, you know what? Like, I think I should go all in, right? But I want to be more strategic with it because uh, this is like January 2019. 
Mm-hmm. I had, I, you know, I knew I was going to Presence Club again that year on my my free Presence Club trip in the summer. I wanted that. Um, you know, I'm a year end. You know, bonuses are going to hit as well fiscal year, and yep. I also knew uh, a bunch of stock was going to invest as well, and I also knew we we're going to have an earnings call uh, every quarter. I was going to skyrocket skyrocket the equity. So I was strategic. So I wait till um, September, mid September, yep. when the, the last earnings call, so the stock would skyrocket. So I had my I had my trip. I got my vesting. I got I got everything else. <laughs> Wait for literally to all the things that fall in place. And then the next day I resigned, went all, all in my business. And uh, I started my business. Um, and that was really scary, actually, really yeah. scary for me because I was like, I was used to having this structure and process and all these things that was all, all my own. Um, and I started, you know, I started to uh, just go all in the business. And it was really, the first six months was really hard. I mean, first year yeah. was really hard, right? Just building up. You don't know what you don't know. You a lot of trial and error. Um, but now, fast forward, man. Um, shoot, man, we've been. The business for just over four years. Um, I think I, my last count. Thank you. My last count was like in that time, five hundred fifty plus clients, um, and they're. I mean, they're everywhere. They're all the way from like small startups, like no name startups, like barely doing a million AR to mm-hmm. Salesforce, Zoom Info, ADP, you know, Fortune five hundred. A lot of a lot of organizations, and like everything in between too. <laughs> all right, that's awesome. Um, yeah. So it's been. Uh, it's been it's been a blessing, right? Uh, during that time, I wrote a book as well. So I wrote, I wrote my I wrote decided to write a book. I'm like mm-hmm. I said I'm gonna write, do it in three months. Wrote a book in three months. Became a Wall Street Journal best selling book in three months on nice. sales. I'm like, um, so it's been a really rewarding journey. Really scary as well. Really hard for sure. Every day uh-huh. is like this still though, right? Because that's kind of yep. the life of the entrepreneur. But I mean, I look back, I wouldn't trade it for the world. That's awesome. Now I have to ask, okay, put yourself back in your shoes yeah. when you're on that sales floor with that hundred yeah. plus team. Yeah. What's your word of advice you'd have for yourself now being on this side of it on the journey? Mm. Well, um, I, I would say it's it's one of those things where sometimes the best advice is true, not new. Right? Mm-hmm. It's true advice, but not just a new advice. Um, and as I look back, when you know I was running that big org, um, especially when you run a big org, um, mm-hmm. it's build systems from the get go. Because when you're running that big of an org, everything everything before is, is just tribal knowledge is in your head. But yeah. if you don't have systems, you can't scale. And when I first started taking over the big team, I didn't have any systems in place for that size of a team. So what happened was like before when I was running a direct sales team that went from uh, four reps to twenty reps reporting directly to me. Mm-hmm. Like I was direct sales manager, you have tight control on everything, right? Yeah. So you can still have some systems, but like because like they report directly to you, you can have more control, if you will. As yeah. you scale up, you start realizing you just only have so much time, and yeah. you fall to level of systems you have in place. And I really didn't realize that my first, I mean, my first month, my first, my first quarter, I was just working like 80, 90 hours a week, and like I got like nothing done. I was behind my number. You know, mm-hmm. so I was like, I didn't have a systems in place. But then once I realized what, well, first, let me, let me back up. First, identify the constraints mm-hmm. that you have in your overall business and then build systems to relieve those constraints and maximize the upside for it. Because okay. once I started doing that, I started realizing my constraints. I'm like, okay. Like, for here's a good example. To go to that team, uh, took me too long to figure out. Realized very quickly, every sales leader, that I had because I had nine managers reporting to me at that time, they were not like me when I was a sales manager. And I realized they didn't have the proper system to be a highly effective sales leader. Mm -hmm. So that's constraint. And if I didn't solve that constraint, then I'd have to like still be way too hands-on with all the reps, which I couldn't do at that scale. So what can I do? Build a better system to train, develop the, the leaders, right? But then I ran to another constraint as I realized three months later as I started to promote some of them. I didn't have backfills. Oh, I didn't have backfills. So what's the system? I need to build a system within the sales rep org to train, develop the future leaders that give them not just selling skills, but leadership skills. Uh, mm-hmm. I do how to hire, train, develop rock stars. So again, another system because the constraint I covered. So as I look back, it's like identify the constraints. Identify constraints, prioritize the constraints, yeah. <laughs> and then build the systems to solve a constraint. That's awesome. No, I, it's good advice because I think there's so many times where you get caught off guard. You're just setting up the things that you need to do tomorrow. <laughs> yep. And next thing you know, you're going, I'm buried. 
and and a lot of yeah, organizations yeah. whether it's scaling down or scaling up or or right now a lot of teams i feel like are having to do the same output with yeah. less people and those systems oh, yeah. same thing it, they have to be there well i think it's why you, it's key to have a long time horizon right mm -hmm. because if you don't have a long time horizon you'll choose a short term solution but if you understand your, if your time horizon is much longer, then you're more likely to identify the right constraint, highest priority, and then build the right long-term system. Even though you see immediate results, you know if you put it in place, it'll pay long-term dividends. That is a piece of wisdom I think many don't look at, especially as we live quarter to quarter, right? 100%. That is the hardest thing. Take that breath, pull yourself back a little bit, and, and look at it from a longer horizon. Well, that's right. Marcus, I have had an amazing time listening to you, learning from you. Um, thank you so much for joining us on this episode. And uh, I, I just want to thank all of our audience for listening. Um, you can catch this anywhere your podcasts go or uh, on YouTube as well. Make sure you check out the video of this. It's been such a good conversation. Thanks for, uh, thanks for joining me. My pleasure. Awesome. All right. We hope you enjoyed this episode of B2B EQ. Be sure to rate, subscribe, and follow the podcast for more exciting insights. To learn more about the value of EQ and the technology powering today's conversations, visit us at unifor.com.